Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about asynchronous functions in JavaScript, which is part of, I um, can't remember if it's part of ES6 or ES7. It seems like it's part of ES7. So we have async await. Uh, yesterday we talked a little bit about promises and dealing with asynchronous calls. Um, the async await proposal makes this even easier than what we currently do with promises. It just takes a little bit of getting used to. So in order to enable async await, um, Babel can transpile that back to ES5 for you. But you have to have, um, in our webpack at least, we have the Babel loader, and then we give it the option where we have stage equals zero, which means we've turned on a whole bunch of experimental features like async await. Um, also the static keyword works for us inside of our classes. And then you do the optional equals runtime. Um, we were trying to include the regenerator loader via a loader and we had some problems with that. But if you just say optional equals runtime, then that will set up all of the uh, polyfills that you need to make everything function. Okay. So I want to talk just a little bit about the code um, that you would write and why you would do it this way. So go over here. Here's the code that we took a look at yesterday. Um, you'll notice that we have this do request method right here, and it returns a promise. And every one of our methods that makes a call to the server calls do request and returns the return value from do request, which means that every single one of these methods right here will return a promise. And typically, um, like we discussed yesterday, you would return a promise and then you could do promise.then and get the return value from that function call and do something with it. But we're going to look at this uh, in a slightly different way and use async await. So one of the reasons we might do this, um, in the flux architecture, in the diagram that you'll typically see, let me pull that up really quickly. So you, when you talk about flux, you've got the uh, this web utils layer, Oops, right here. So we've got this web utils. Um, one of the issues that we run into inside of the flux architecture is that. The action creators are the ones who get to call out to the API and figure out, do I need to go get data or not? Well, actually, it just it doesn't know the or not part. It just knows I need to go get data from the API. When that data comes back, it generates an action, hits the dispatcher, populates the store, and then the data lives in the store. So we ran into this issue where how do we cache data? How do we know if we've made a request before and we don't necessarily need to make it again. So one of the experiments that we're gonna try out here to help simplify that is we're actually going to move the, the question of do I need to go get this data into the web API utils, into the layer that actually knows how to make the call. Um, and then it can intelligently decide, do I already have this data or do I need to make a call to the server? Now that code can get really ugly. And so what we wanted to do was just create a new um, layer of files. So we're going to create a API folder here. So this is just going to be some example code. Uh, we won't hold on to this. Um, anyway, so if I had, for example, a a users JS inside of my API directory, there we go. Then um, I could move some of the logic from here over into that uh, user's layer. So um, one of the things might be if we added a new action that was uh, load profile. Now the load profile method might be hit any number of times. Like I might browse into my profile, browse away, and then browse back. Now I don't need to hit the profile API every time if I have already gotten the data once already. So um, if without a caching layer, it might look something like this. Get uh, users slash profile, it's users slash some identifier for that user. So we might have a, a user ID. This, and we're gonna get the profile. So if you provide me with a user ID, I can go out and get your profile. And that works all fine and dandy. 
but um, and then this would dispatch an action afterwards. Um, so it would be something like constants dot profile loaded. So that's how we would have typically done this. Now, if we want to actually cache the data at this at this layer, then what we can do is say, well, let's make the API call inside of this other class over here. So we're going to do default um, something like this. And then this can have like a get profile method. do something like this. All right, so this assumes that we have imported everything we need. So we would you know, import API from probably like dot, dot slash action slash API. All right, so now in my actions, I would refactor that to instead just call this right here. And so we come up and say import users API from actions slash users. Right, not actions, sorry. API slash users. So then I would have this thing and I can just say you go get the profile. And then um, when that's done we'll we'll do something with it. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the something that we do with it here in just a second. Okay. So inside of here now, this guy is going to return a promise. Now we could do what we did yesterday, and I could do a then, and we could do a function, or you know we could write it the new way, and say, oops, we use arrow functions, like that. But it's a little bit cleaner to use async away. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to declare this to be an asynchronous function. And as soon as I do that, this function will fall out of the normal application flow. It becomes asynchronous, which means that by default, this function is going to return a promise. So every time you put async in front of a function, it no longer returns a value. Instead, it returns a promise. Okay. So when I do that, the benefit I get is I don't have to do this then part right here. I can do this. So that looks almost like synchronous code that we are used to writing over and over again. And the await will actually stop the flow of this function until api.get returns. And that's why we declare the function as asynchronous, because we don't want the rest of the application to wait. We only want this function to wait. So when api.get is done with its method call, we're going to get a promise back, and we can then do something with that. Um, and in fact, this await is what will wait for that promise. And then um, it actually will take the value that was returned from that promise and return that. So instead of profile equaling a promise at this point, it's going to actually equal the value that was returned to us from the API, which is really kind of cool. So then, um, you know, we can just return, oops, return the profile. Now, in our code, if we don't pass a constant right here, <coughs> excuse me, if we pass a null, then um, it won't it won't trigger an action. Um, so we can say, let's send this a null and let's, let's let somebody else deal with actually sending out the action. All right, so then moving back up into our actions layer. So I have these user actions with load profile. So now I can declare this guy to also be an asynchronous function, which means it will, it'll fall out of the normal application flow. And this works really well for action creators because um, whenever a view or a React component triggers one of these action creators, it doesn't typically wait around for a return value. There's not really any expected return value from these things. And you can see that through this code. You don't see these things returning anything. 
So they make a good candidate for asynchronous because nobody's going to be sitting around waiting for these guys to do something. So now what I can do is I can put, um, I can put this, and I can wait for this other guy to finish. And then I can just dispatch an action like this, say the profile is loaded, and the data can be the profile. So that's pretty clean code. We don't have to have a then with an anonymous function um, that is waiting for the promise to complete. I can read through this pretty quickly. But you're probably asking yourself, well, that looks just like the code we wrote in the user's API layer. What's the point? So this is the point right here. What if I wanted to um, cache this data? I could do something like this. You could say, um, our profile equals null. And then when the profile gets returned right here, I can store that off. So now, if I have a profile, I can just return that and we can be done. We don't ever have to make this API call. So now this layer of our code, this API layer, can determine whether or not a piece of data needs to be cached. And then the logic for expiring that cache can live inside of this code as well. So by using async await, we're able to, one, make some pretty clean, pretty easy to read code. Um, and two, we're able to enable caching in the layer that knows about the data, knows whether or not it actually needs to cache or retrieve the data from cache or retrieve it from the API. So I, maybe this is just pseudo code, but uh, does net profile need to be like hash or user IDs? Um, yeah, that's probably how you'd want to do this. I was assuming that this was this is the profile for one user, but um, sure, if you wanted to do this, you could say, well, let's let's make this a hash, and we're gonna have um, underscore profile user ID. So that exists, then we'll return it. Otherwise, we need it, and then we'll we'll return it there. So that would be. Um, that would Justin, be can you still hear me? Yeah. So you can even just have one return statement and just check if it's not defined, and then do the call, and then just return it at the bottom. Yeah. So that that's a great refactor. So this would actually be better code, right? But again, you can see how this is really pretty clean because otherwise um, your code would look something like this. Profile user ID and return new promise. Uh, and then, I can't remember what's the syntax for promise. Uh, looks like this guy right here. So I can just copy and paste this over. Okay, so then um, got to do this guy right here. So thinking a little bit more about caching, like how would you know you need to go get it from the server? And how would you how would you have the ability to flush the cache? I guess that would just be more tooling you put on top of it, right? But it is, and so that seems like it should be general tooling. Well, when to flush the cache is always is like an enormous question across everything that you ever build. It's like, how do you know we need to go get new data? So, well, maybe and it's like this. So maybe you just have a boolean that says force retrieve, right? And then <clears throat> you can right in, in your Git profile thing, you know, and if that's you know, if that's set, you know, expire, then uh, then you always go get it. Yeah, you could do something like that. I would turn that, for the expire first, right? Uh, yeah, but either way, that, that forces your logic up a layer. Um, so it just makes it somebody else's problem, right? Like somebody has to figure out when do we expire this, which might not be a bad thing. The layers above you might 
know better whether or not you need to go get data. For example, the user updated their profile, so hey, go get some new data. Um, right. But you could also say, as long as you're using this layer to handle your caching, then I would put you know the async code or the code in here to update the profile, and then this guy would intelligently say, oh, by the way, we're going to expire this because we did an update, right? So, you know, yeah. logic to update the user goes here. Um, or you could even be more intelligent and say, well, we know what they've updated it to. So, like, they updated the name or, let's see. Right. Yeah, so we would just change, like, that guy dot name equals new name. Um, so you could do that, too. One of the interesting things that um, I and Jaden started to explore, uh, we'll probably put this off for a while, is the possibility of having these guys be generators. So you could call next on it. So this guy would return um, one value, which would probably be your cached value. I'm sorry, this guy right here would return one value, uh, the cached value. But then you could call next on it. Um, sorry, that I guess we, that kind of steps into the whole world of, of jo uh, generators in JavaScript. But uh, it's similar to the idea of observables. And in fact, a lot of the async generator proposal code has moved into observables. So ES 2016, 2017 might actually have observables built in. We'll see. Um, but this guy would return one value, and your view being React would just update with that value, and then it would pump a new value out to you after it finishes the get request. So you would always get the benefit of the immediacy of rendering based on the data that you have sitting in the client, and then you would get the freshest data based on it having made an API call and come back with new stuff. And if the stuff didn't change, then nothing would change when it re-rendered. But if stuff had changed, then it might update the user's name or whatever. So it might just take a second um, to get that freshest data. So that would be another approach to figuring out uh, whether or not you need to go out. Um, well, actually, you would, it's not a... we figure out whether we need to go get cache value or go get data fresh from the API. You always go get data fresh from the API, but you start out with the data that you have in the cache. Does that make sense? Maybe not. We'll talk about generators maybe in another training and then we can maybe demonstrate how we would actually do it. Because I think seeing the code would, would help to solidify the idea. Other questions? Okay. Well, that's async await. Um, if you want to use it in a project, let me know, because we have to turn it on. Um, and we want to use it with some caution because it is still a proposal, but I think it's a pretty solid proposal at this point. I'm pretty sure we'll see it in future versions of JavaScript. Okay. Thanks, you guys.